we, we have two minutes, we can start anyway. Everybody will come up to lunch later anyway. Um, I have good news and bad news for you. <clears throat> the bad news is that I've lost my voice yesterday completely and just recovering. Uh, my colleagues here in Prague were helpful enough to get me some medicine. It works, but it has some consequences, so, um, so bear with me. And the problem is that it's after, after the lunch time, so you might be getting a little bit sleepy because of my low voice. Because those who know me, they know that this is not my voice at all. Um, so I will, I will try to be a little bit more entertaining, but you know, it's kind of impossible today. The good news is that even if you get sleepy, um, you have comfortable chairs and all, um, the talk will not take all the 15 minutes. It will be a bit shorter, I hope. Um, so we will survive. All right, and this is just about time to start, right? So welcome to the talk about test containers. Uh, my name is Anton. I uh, work for a company called Zero Turnaround, and we are famous for tools that we make for developers, especially for Java developers. Um, Jarable is probably the most famous one. If you don't know about that, you can ask about the tool from me later. Um, but the reason I'm talking about integration testing is that our tools, the products that we make, uh, they integrate with all kinds of frameworks, application servers, uh, other tools. So you, you probably noticed that I said the word integrate, right? So we actually have to test all those integrations uh, before they get the product to you. And, well, it requires integration testing. Surprise, surprise. And, well, I have <clears throat> a little bit hard time speaking, and uh, I will make a little bit of, you know, interactive sessions here. Uh, speak to me. Why do we need integration testing at all? Can't we just get away with unit testing? Depends. Depends on what? I mean, I could just get 100% coverage. Why not? Like, why do I need integration testing? But the integration test checks if what, how our API works and how what, what we did put in our database. Okay, so the, 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 the microservices, APIs, or whatever protocols we have, uh, they require, like, what, what do they have in common? They go to the network, right? So one property of an integration test could be that it goes into network, and if we want to avoid that, we start mocking it, and it's not, not an integration test anymore, it's kind of a component test. Um, but why do we want to go to the network. I can give you an example I had like probably 10 years ago. Um, we had a project which, uh, it was a simple project. It took data from one place and inserted the data to Oracle database. And uh, one, it, it was working fine. It was a stable project. Uh, we didn't do any changes. But one day we migrated from JAL 1.4 to JAL 1.5. And guess what? The Oracle database driver was relying on the two-string implementation of Big Decimal. So it was formatting the, the numbers a little bit in a different way. And the new version of the driver, or no, not in the very new version of the driver, but the new version of Java, uh, the two-string implementation changed. And uh, the, the result of the formatting in Big Decimal was a different one. So. <clears throat> what we end up, ended up in production when we switched from, you know, old version of Java to the new version of Java is that instead of inserting uh, like a very little number into the database, we inserted a few millions. 
So you can think if it was an account of some bank, right? Instead of uh, transferring a few cents of money, you, you, you have transferred a few millions of euros to that account. Obviously, that's a bug, right? And if we, like, our unit test coverage was perfect, 100%, but we didn't test it against the real database, right? We actually mocked the database with H2 implementation. That's a very common thing to do. Who did that? Everybody. That's a like terrible anti-pattern. All right, there are people who think that if you have to write integration tests, uh, then you didn't write enough unit tests. Well, you have to be a little bit more practical than that. Everybody knows this meme, right? Two unit tests, zero integration tests. Two components working perfectly on their own and don't work together really well, like this one. Sorry. Does it start? No. Yes. Have you seen it? That's a perfect one. <laughs> or, or another one. Let me show you. Oops. For some reason it... Well, will it start? No? Yes. So this is what happens when you don't do integration testing in real life. <laughs> Think of it. Uh, so you need integration testing even if you are not a developer. Um, so, okay, so let's talk again. <clears throat> what are the challenges we have when we have to implement integration tests? Who, by the way, writes integration tests in their projects? I think the majority, right? Over 50%. Okay, what kind of issues do you have? Performance, good. Another one? Data separation. Data separation. So basically, configuration, setting it all up, and somehow, you know, configuring, preparing the data, and so on, right? So, correct. We have those, like, how many tests we can run per time unit, basically a performance issue, because the tests are slow, you get all those challenges, like, getting the feedback faster, because if you have a lot of them, you want to run them concurrently, and they, have, they will start fighting for the resources. And complex setup, right? Uh, I don't know, it, it happened to me, like, I came to a new project, someone told me, hey, here's the wiki page, please read that, and we talk to you in a, in a week. Uh, like, you read it, you install all the components, and so on. So it, it shouldn't be like that, it should be like a, I check out the code, I open it in my ID, and I can run it, right? I should be productive right away. Uh, so what are the requirements that we want to have in our projects uh, or for, for those integration tests? Is that, first of all, reproducible environment should be like the, the foundation, right? So if I run the test, you run the test, it should be the same result, right? Like on my machine, on your machine, are in continuous integration environment. Uh, they should be isolated. I mean, they should not conflict if we have two tests running concurrently and they require the same port. Let's say we, if we start two Tomcat containers on the same machine, right? One of them will fail, obviously, if we don't reconfigure them somehow. So <clears throat> it should be all automatic, out of the box. It should be as real as possible. Remember this use case of the database, right? You probably want to actually uh, use a real database in our tests. Cross-platform, well, I'm using Mac, you're probably using Linux or Windows, and it should be all the same uh, for, for us. When we clone the project, start it up, it should work. And it should be easy to set up and maintain, unless, like otherwise people who try to avoid writing the integration tests or even running them, <clears throat> so it's a good feature to have. Now, who's using Docker here? Like in production. <laughs> <Let's see. laughs> now, I think Docker is a very nice feature, a very nice tool uh, to work with in development. It really saves a lot of time when you have to automate the environment. I'm 
I don't know how many people actually use Docker. It, they did, in, in production, the number actually grows over, every time I ask this way. Um, we are actually using uh, Amazon Container Service, uh, which runs Docker. So we are using Docker in production. Um, and uh, Docker kind of brings this thing to us that the, the very first requirement that I mentioned, right? The reproducible environment for us. So if we just, you know, wrap it up, or wrap it up all up into containers and have only Docker installed, ideally that would be the only dependency on, on your system to run integration tests. Uh, but you, you shouldn't go to the extremes, uh, be practical, maybe it's enough to have Docker and Java installed in your machine. Um, <clears throat> but we, we, we started uh, to work uh, with Docker when we had more people coming to the team, because before that, uh, our, our, our tools are about 10 years old, and um, we, uh, we had our own automation for the tests. It was a proprietary, like scripting. Nobody know, knew how to maintain it, like uh, from the newcomers, of course. So it was very hard to get people on board into the projects. And as more people came, they were you know, struggling and uh, proposing that let's improve that. And we started to look into Docker for automating the tests for our uh, new product, which is called Extrable Hub. Um, and we came up with the solution that basically um, we had all the con different you know, dependencies, external dependencies wrapped into the containers, into the images that we could start during the unit tests, J unit tests, uh, not really unit tests, right? Um, so we could drive it all from J unit. And uh, we came uh, across the test containers project, which already provided uh, some functionality for us, and we decided, okay, we, we can actually contribute to test containers and don't have our own proprietary automation for, for this kind of things. So now we are just using test containers. And uh, I, I think it's useful to mention what are we actually testing here. So this is like a draft uh, diagram I, I stealed from Wiki uh, from, for that service. It's, it's not microservices-based architecture. It's just, uh, I don't know, we have several applications running in, in Amazon, uh, and, and they require some external dependencies as well. So those green circles uh, are the ones that are our teams are maintaining and, and writing, implementing. So those are just basically uh, Spring Boot applications. Uh, besides that little uh, circle below, that's a uh, JVM agent. We'll talk about it later a little bit. But those three on the top, those are just basic uh, Spring applications. And the red circles are the external dependencies, right? So the database, the cache, Elasticsearch, something else. So <clears throat> test containers actually provides us the automation to run JUnit tests with external dependencies. And how does it work? It wraps uh, Docker Java, the library, uh, to communicate with Docker environment, so it can do auto discovery uh, by searching by those environment variables. Uh, so if Docker machine is not started yet, it will start it up for you. Dep like start the container there and shut it down if needed after the tests are complete. Right, and uh, in your unit tests, J unit tests, sorry. You can just define the external dependencies by, by using JUnit rules. Uh, basically, you declare a field in your, your test uh, by saying that, hey, I need a dependency on Redis. And you describe it, like you give it a name and a version and say that there, there is a port that I want to access within the container. And uh, well, Test containers will automate it all for you. It will pull in the image from Docker Hub uh, and, and uh, start it up for you. Or if, if you need 
for this uh, for for um, for for databases, there are specialized containers that provide you some convenience methods. Uh, like in this case, you have username, password. Uh, but in most cases, you can get away with just the generic container API and uh, some builder builder pattern there. So let me show you a basic, very basic example. Some hello world, basically. Sorry. Uh, if you want to look at that. There is a, like a very nice uh, project at GitHub, test containers Java, and there are examples. So I'm using one of the, the examples in, for this demo. And let's see, Gcan demo, new window. Okay, let's start clean. So we have. <coughs> First of all, what, what are we testing? We have, ah, uh, damn it. Sorry, probably have to configure the display. Displays. How do you configure that? No? Anyone knows how to configure that? I want to mirror the display. Okay, mirror displays. Yes, it worked. Perfect. Okay, so we have an interface, which is a cache with two methods, put and get. Right, and uh, the implementation of the cache relies on, J, uh, on, on Redis uh, and uses JDS, JDS driver to communicate with that. So, if you want to put a value into that, it will actually store the value in the external process, right? So, it will communicate to that external dependency, which is Redis in our case. So, what if we want to test that? Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, we need uh, an external dependency. We will just declare that, hey, there is a JUnit rule now that will create a new instance of that container uh, for every test that we run. Next thing is that we actually need to initialize JDS driver. Uh, let me close this one. And... Uh, that should be a field, a cache, right? So we create an instance of JDS driver, we create an instance of uh, JDS backed cache, which is the implementation of our cache, and basically we have, we have it all. We, we, we need to test it now, right? Let's write a test. I'm fast, right? Um, so we, here we test that uh, Whatever we put into the cache, we actually get it back, right? We put a value foo in there, and we want to get it back. And uh, let's write another test that will be fast as well. Um, so here we test if whatever we put into the cache, we, like, if we didn't put it there, and we try to retrieve the value from an empty cache, then it should not be there, right? Um, so assert false, not present basically, yes. Um, what will happen if I start this up now? So if I didn't have an image on my machine yet, uh, test containers would pull in the image from, from the internet, right? It would take a little bit of time if you start it for the first time. Um, and, and then once it gets the, um, the image, it will start Docker machine, if it's not started yet, start the container and execute the test then. Let's try that. Run the cache. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And we can see it in the logs. It will actually print out that uh, the information about Docker environment, as you can see, it has discovered, hey, there is Docker environment I can use. Uh, and since I already have 
the image, it didn't take time to pull it down. It just started it and executed both tests. It would be good actually to fail one of the tests before we proceed, right? Run. Do the same. So we'll see it's failing. I'm not cheating, right? Good. So remember I was talking about ports. If you want to, to run those integration tests concurrently, uh, if you have a lot of them, you probably will have like a lot of them running concurrently. And they would start competing for the same port if we you now just uh, configured it somehow in a Docker way when we map the port, the, the internal port to the one that is in local machine. Uh, here in the declaration of, of this dependency, I have said that, hey, I need to expose a port 6379, which is a default port for Redis, which runs inside the container. So that is the Redis port. And uh, by, by calling this method, I'm basically declaring that please test containers generate a random port for this, for this port and map it on my local machine. Okay, but I have two tests and I have started, like when, when uh, the new test starts, the new instance of this container is actually created. So we can actually check what is the port that is being generated. So for this test, we can ask for what kind of port did it actually generate? And for this test as well. Okay, so if we start them again, oh, I can probably fix it now. We don't want to see red bars. Um, we will see what kind of port is generated for both of the t those tests um, when, when we get a new instance of the container every time. So, for the first time, it was 3, 2, let me zoom it in a little bit, 3, 2, 8, 2, 4, and the next time it's a different one, 3, 2, 8, 2, 5. So the first time, when, when it was started for the first time, it basically took some so, sort of a default value that it has, checked if the port is open, started the container, uh, mapped the port to that new one, and, and for the next time, I think it just uses the sequence uh, for getting a new port. Okay. So this way, we can actually start a lot of tests on the same machine without the risk to conflict for, you know, this kind of resources. Mm, okay. So that's the hello world. Taking the medicine. Um, microservices, someone mentioned microservices. Uh, well, in our, it's, it's just to grab the attention, right? It's just the password. Uh, but if you have distributed applications, uh, let's say you have multiple applications running and they have to communicate somehow. Uh, one of the uh, things that you want to get is to exclude uh, like uh, uncertainties, like it should be reproducible when you run the tests. And uh, one thing you probably would like to avoid is having a result of one application of, of the test for the test uh, to be dependent on some other application, which you know might change the behavior a little bit during the development, because you are developing your own application. And this way, you probably would like to isolate your application. It should still work the same way as it would run in production. So we are not replacing the drivers. We are not mocking anything inside the application. It will be the real application running there. It probably will use some real dependencies <clears throat> like a database, for instance, or a Redis cache, but we would mock the uh, the other service uh, by replacing it, but not inside the application, by not 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 mocking the driver itself, but rather really replacing the external dependency. 
So one good thing is uh, with test containers is that if you already have your JUnit tests that rely on um, external dependencies, it's very easy to add you know, test containers into your project by just declaring those fields uh, for external dependencies. So you, you may still use all the goodies that are provided by, by, by your testing framework. If you are using Spring, for instance, uh, you can still use all that and just declare those external dependencies as you need. So in this example, I have Postgre database and uh, Redis that are provided out of the box uh, by test containers. And then <clears throat> I have a mock server container, which is just for demonstration this time. If I have my application depending on some other service, which I don't want to be involved in in this local integration testing, then I would like to mock it. And and uh, I would mock it as a you know external dependency there, again, using test containers. And there is a very nice project called mock server provides the APIs for Python, Java, whatever else. Uh, and uh, you can just describe what kind of response you should get from, from that server. Uh, basically, like in a mock way, but you know, you're not mocking it inside the JVM itself. Uh, so how, do, how does it look like? We can derive from a generic container to describe our own container somehow, just for example. And in this example, we are you know, pulling in the mock server uh, image from Docker Hub and are saying that, hey, there should be uh, a mapped port for 8080. So inter like, internally inside the container, the mock server will run on 8080, but we will see some other port externally from our local machine. and. Uh, here is just an example how you can make uh, the things a little bit more convenient for yourself. Uh, generic container provides you the lifecycle of the container, of the Docker container itself, so you can detect when it started and uh, do some you know, initialization if you need. So in this example, we are initializing a mock server client, which is a mock server you know, API dependency that we pull into the project. And then we can just describe what kind of response we should get if we call that endpoint, you know. So it's a very simple example. This way we can actually keep our own application running like as it, as it should without mocking anything inside, but just isolate it from, you know, other things. The other example that I have <clears throat> is about testing the agent. So uh, in our system, we have a few Spring Boot applications running in, the <clears throat> in, in uh, Amazon, and there is an agent that the users would install to their application by just configuring the JVM property, and then the agent is responsible for collecting all kinds of metrics, uh, adding new behavior to the application, so it's a, it's a monitoring agent and it would send the data to Amazon back, whatever it has collected, so that we could, it could you know, render nice dashboards for you, what kind of you know, response uh, time your application has, and so on. So <clears throat> this agent is a little bit tricky thing to test. So how do you test the agent? First of all, you have to think, what is the functionality that agent provides? And what it has to do in order to actually implement that. Uh, at the start, it intercepts all, all the classes that are being loaded into the JVM and adds new behavior there. Right? So, uh, for instance, it can uh, instrument the database driver in order to measure how much time it takes to execute the query or how much time it takes to execute an external HTTP request and so on. So in order to test this kind of functionality, we actually have to implement uh, a corresponding application, a test application, and we have a lot of them, right? Because we have a lot of functionality inside the agent that you know, monitors the behavior inside Spring Framework, maybe, uh, WebLogic, Wildfly, and so on. So we have to make sure that 
it, all the integrations work. So we have to implement all different applications for, 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 for those tests. From the test engineer point of view, uh, it doesn't really matter. He has to know just the, um, what, what is the added behavior. So if I say that my application is now running with the agent, and if I make a request to that application, it should respond with some you know, property, for instance. So let me give you an example. Um, I have a little project here, which is, by the way, it was at GitHub, so if you check the slides later, there's a link to that repository. Uh, so what it does, we have an agent. Uh, it's a very simple one. If you don't know anything about Java agents, they are just there in since Java 1.5, and uh, it's basically an API for you to intercept class loading and retransform classes somehow the way you want. The, the way you want. So in this example, what I'm doing is I'm inter intercepting uh, the loading of a jetty handler. So when I detect that there is a jetty handler being loaded, I will instrument it a little bit by adding an extra header to the response object. So when I access that application, uh, if it's running with my agent, it should respond with an extra header, which will be x, my super header, and some value. Right? So let's, let's see how it works. Um, I have Java options already set up. Oh, sorry, like this. Um, I'm not sure if I should make it bigger or not. It's probably visible, right? Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm, I, I say that I need uh, Java options and I need uh, to set Java agent property to, to the VM. And I have built the agent already from this source, right? Um, now, if I start my application, which is, by the way, written in Groovy, that's a Groovy script, which uh, starts sp Spark framework, which already has the embedded Jetty container. When I declare this endpoint, it will actually start the container. And all I need is to, is this application would respond with something, you know? It doesn't matter what it responds, I will check the header, because this is what we are testing in our agent. Um, so if I start the application, all I need is to, to do is to start the script, right? Groovy, and then run the script. It's a bit slowish, but still. So it starts on 4567. Let's see what the application responds. And we have an endpoint called hello. Well, it's there, right? But this is not what we are interested in. We are interested in the header. Let's see. Uh, network, refresh. OK. So let me zoom it in a little bit. So we have low endpoint, and we have that header being added because we run with the agent, right? So instrumented the response of Jetty Handler and added the header there. So we want to test if we start with the agent, the application res should respond with this value. OK. So how does the test look like? Uh, agent test. It's a very simple one, right? We we execute the res like the request, we get the response, we check if the header is there. Nothing special here. Very simple test. So all the magic is somewhere in this basic test tab. Let's check that. So there's something something uh, interesting already. We have a client, not a mock server client, but it's, it's a faint client basically. You know to make a request. Uh, and then we we see that there is a like uh, some 
super call with uh, a Groovy script, and it tells us that we want to expose a port uh, which was the default port of Jetty in Spark framework, and there is a wait strategy that tells us that we want to wait until this endpoint actually responds something, right? Okay, that's super actually is also an interesting one. It, it does a few things. So uh, first of all, it pulls in the image which contains Groovy because we, are, we have a Groovy script. We want to start that Groovy script inside the container. And obviously, we need Groovy inside the container, right? That's why we packaged Groovy for ourselves, and we have it at Docker Hub, and, and then we pull it in if we need it. And next, we would say that, OK, we actually need this agent jar to be visible inside the container. We just build it with our own script locally. And now we want to map it, map it to some path inside the container. So we say that, hey, the class, class, class path resource mapping and uh, this agent jar, which we have, it, have in our class path right now, it should be visible somewhere in slash agent.jar within the container. And it's fine if it's read-only. And the same for, uh, for the script, so we, because we want the script to run inside the container as well. Next, there is like a, a few optimizations because we we are pulling in uh, the dependencies and we are they are pro probably already uh, in our local dot groovy uh, folder, so we can just map that folder into the you know into the uh, container itself, so that it doesn't have to pull the dependencies in again. Next, we need to set the Java options as I did in my local machine. And the path will be the same as we declared within the mapping, right? So it's, it should be visible on this path. And now we just start Groovy with this Groovy script. And we, start, uh, we declare that there will be a Java agent. So it starts with the agent. It starts the application. And it has a new behavior, right? So all we need now is to execute the request to that exposed port of the container, and we get the response with the new header. Nice. So <clears throat> what if we do that? Gradle, test. So again, if, if we don't have the image yet, the groovy image, right? it would go to the Docker Hub, pull the image down, start it up. Uh, Assemble the container that we just declared with this uh, DSL or Fluent API, and start the, start the server within the container, and then execute the request. Let's see how it's fa how, how it is failing. Um, so if we run the test, let's say we we uh, test for some other value there, so it should fail. Okay, we can see it, 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 it has failed. So if we open the report, close this, and we, we, we now see that, okay, there is a failure, and because it's a different value, something different that we expected. All right. So it, it actually, uh, for us, uh, the, the simplicity here, like uh, the value, is that we can create a lot of those testing apps as scripts, and uh, it's very easy to maintain this way. Now, where do I want to get slides? OK. So it's actually everything, and I, I promised it will be less than 15 minutes. So we all survived. Someone is actually sleeping, I can see there. Um, the project is really active, very good documentation, there's a Twitter, Twitter handle, uh, there is a Slack channel if you want to learn more about that. Uh, I will put my slides up 
just in a few minutes, and uh, you can check it later if you want, uh, especially those links to GitHub repositories. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for listening, and if you have questions, you can ask now, or better if you ask, you know, in person, because it's hard to, to speak a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so, thank you. <laughs>